Cameron, we're going to get this started. So thank you everyone so much for being here today. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce the first speaker, Johannes Christopoulos. Johannes did his undergraduate studies in Germany at the CSU Department of Biology in Wisconsin. He was a postdoc in visiting faculty at Princeton before starting here at the Duquesne um, School of Environment and Sustainability. He also was a visiting scholar in Australia at the Max Planck Institute in Germany. He's the author of numerous papers as well as four books, and most lately, Infectious Disease Ecology and Conservation, which was published in Oxford University Press and just came out the press last week. So uh, please join me in welcoming today's speaker. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming today. Um, before we get started, um, can you, is, does this work now with Zoom? Can you, can you hear me okay? All right, okay. So let's get going. So I want to talk about the, this issue of um, trying to understand future extinctions um, in the context of past extinctions. Try to see how what has happened in the past can help us manage the upcoming biodiversity crisis. And basically I've been working on this topic for a number of years now. So we're starting to build up a body of knowledge that starts to paint a pretty holistic picture. This is work that has been going on with the assistance of numerous people that are given here, numerous universities, um, many, many students who've helped with this work um, and funding from a variety of sources. Um, and essentially to give you an idea of what the overview is going to be, um, of the lecture, I want to start by introducing just the concept of species extinction in general, and then talk about reptile biogeography in the GNC, what it is, why it matters, why it's useful, um, and then sort of like talk about this topic of island extinctions, what has happened in the past, and um, what can we learn from them. So, and, and I'm going to talk there first about the characteristics of species themselves as they may render a species to be more susceptible to extinction. And then also talk as an alternative about the characteristics of um, an island, for example, or habitat fragment and how that interacts with the biology of the species in and then determining whether a species will survive or not. So it's kind of like this um, organism with environment interaction that determines their whether species will survive. So I want to talk about some of the nuances there. Um, and then sort of like what essentially I'm doing in the first part of the, of the talk is I, I talk about how communities respond to climate change. But in reality, at the end of the day, what we see at the community level is the outcome of the interactions of what happens within individual populations. So essentially, I want to sort of like unpack this black box of extinction and try to figure out why a species goes extinct. What's this process? And again, what can we learn from it? Um, and in doing that, I need to focus on two different things. We need to, uh, when, we, when we do this like a cross island comparison, we need to look at adaptive processes, processes and then at non-adaptive processes. Um, okay, so for starters, um, um, I think this audience, everyone knows that we're living in an age of extinction. We're at the be beginning of the six mass extinction event. Um, there's a lot of bad things, unfortunately, coming down the pipeline, but a lot of these things have not happened yet. And humans have a lot of agency in preventing these extinctions from happening. So um, a lot of major organizations, including the United Nations, have actually tried to summarize the information that known at this point we have a pretty good understanding of the main drivers of extinction whether these are um, things like habitat degradation or habitat loss or global climate change or invasive species or overkill they're really a variety of drivers um, and we're starting to have a pretty decent understanding of how each of these um, drives the loss of biodiversity however unfortunately Individual species don't face each of these drivers alone. But what happens often is they face this interacting effects 
between these different drivers simultaneously. And we still have a very poor understanding of how exactly these drivers interact in causing the decline of species. So some of the most important ones, for example, is if you look at the, the habitat effects, um, habitat loss and habitat degradation um, and climate change, they alone um, account for over 50% of the burden that species um, uh, deal with. So over the course of this hour, we're going to be asking questions, you know, how do different species respond to habitat fragmentation isolation or about what kind of habitat characteristics facilitate the survival of taxa? Or how does climate change affect species survival in habitat fragments? And trying to study and understand these things is very difficult because a lot of these processes happen across a large scale and they happen over long periods of time. So extinction, for example, in a habitat fragment like this one here, um, this is a hill that's isolated. It's native habitat um, surrounded by a sea of uh, fields in southern Mexico. It's essentially habitat island. And different species, for example, will experience this type of isolation differently. If you're a snail, your population, however big it is, it's really stuck on that thing. Versus if you're a bird or a butterfly, you might pretty easily fly to the next fragment and establish a metapopulation and then don't you don't experience the effects of fragmentation as severely. So um, a lot of these effects differ between species and they happen across long periods of time. This in turn means that it's difficult to do experiments. It's hard to get the funding agency to, to support you for dozens or hundreds of years, right? <laughs> Until you get your data. So um, it's hard to kind of like address these things. And one of the solutions that people have found to address these kinds of things is to actually um, take advantage of natural um, experiments that have happened, in particular, focus on islands. So I want to focus a little bit on that approach and why it might be useful. So why study island population extinctions? Um, and one of the basic arguments is for many species, whether they're stuck on a real island or whether they're stuck on a habitat fragment, um, it's quite similar. It's not exactly the same. There are some key differences, but there are a lot of similarities. And um, for example, you might be genetically isolated from other populations. Um, the population, there are demographic problems that may befall that population. So there are a lot of analogies that are worth um, uh, pursuing there in order to understand better the long-term nature of the extinction process. And a lot of the work that I'll be describing is work that has happened in this part of the world in the Northeastern Mediterranean uh, basin, in the um, Aegean Sea. Th this um, area really lends itself for um, these kinds of studies because there are thousands of islands. There are over 3,000 islands. So there's a lot of big sample size there for, for analysis. And, um, and we focused there mostly on reptiles. And the reason why we worked on reptiles is because they have several key advantages that make them useful. So they are um, well represented in these ecosystems are functionally important in these food webs and island food webs. Um, they're poor over water dispersers. This is key. This, um, this, these are not species that will float from one island to the, to the other, especially in the Mediterranean, which means that um, historic patterns are not being smeared and homogenized across by present day overwater dispersal. Um, and their distributions have been well documented. So um, I, can, I can speak of generations of, uh, of herpetologists, Northern European herpetologists who chose instead of spending the winter in Sweden or in Germany, for some weird reason, they decided they wanted to spend the winter in the Mediterranean documenting species distributions. So we have excellent data on where these species occur, um, dozens of species on hundreds and thousands of islands. So there's a lot of good information there. Um, the place itself is biologically um, really interesting. It's part of a biodiversity hotspot, so it has a lot of endemic species. 
um, different endemic species of lizards, of snakes. Um, and these occur mostly, if you look at the distribution of these taxa, um, they're non-randomly distributed. So the warmth of the color, I don't know, can we see the, I think the laser pointer, yeah, it's very weak. The, the warmth of the color here denotes the uh, strength, the prominence of the endemic element. And what you find is that endemic species are non-randomly distributed on the islands. Um, what's interesting here is that I, I, will, I will draw your attention to these light colored islands, the cream colored islands in the north, east, and close to the mainland. These are, species, these are islands that do not have endemic species. And the reason why that is, is if you look carefully, the dark gray areas are actually areas that used to be land during the last ice age. So the cream colored islands that do not have endemic species used to be connected to the uh, mainland during the last ice age. So they're very young islands, basically. And as a result, um, they haven't had time for whatever species live there to evolve in isolation into something unique. So, um, if we, so the past really does matter in shaping what lives on these islands today. And I want to dig a little bit more into this by showing you this picture here. Um, this is the same um, region and the light blue areas show that the depth of the blue, of the light blue shows you um, when each region became inundated by rising sea levels. So the way, the best way to understand that is sea level used to be at its lowest during the last ice age. And that's when area, the only areas that were covered by sea are the dark blue ones. And then as the earth came out of the last ice age and sea level rose, um, this, uh, what used to be a continuous landscape became progressively inundated. And essentially um, what used to be maybe peninsulas, <laughs> became pinched off and became islands. So I can elaborate a little bit more on this. This is, um, so oceanographers have done an excellent job in reconstructing sea levels over the last 21,000 years. And it looks like this here. So here you have the present in the upper right corner. We are at zero years. So the x-axis is time, the y-axis is sea level in meters below the present. And we are at present, we're at zero, okay? And what you're seeing is that as, if, as we go back in time, okay, um, what you're seeing is sea level starts dropping about six, 7,000 years ago precipitously, and eventually it, fla uh, it uh, flattens out at around 20,000 years ago. Um, so we have a lot of accurate information about how the, exactly this happened. And you can use this to figure out, for example, if you have an island, present day island, and you have this underwater saddle basically that connects this island, let's say to the mainland. If you go to the deepest point on that underwater saddle, that point tells you, let's say it's minus 55 meters. This tells you that when sea level was 55 meters down from where it is now, this island was barely connected. It was basically like this thing here, okay? So here you see this peninsula that is probably 10 or 20 centimeters below being separated. Then the moment this happens, which is probably gonna happen in the next 50 years, um, all these populations of reptiles living on this peninsula, presumably more or less the same species community that occurs on the neighboring mainland will become isolated. And because they can't cross water, then they'll start experiencing all the problems that, all the ills that befall small isolated populations. So my point here is we can actually reconstruct when each island became separated based on oceanographic and on, um, um, on uh, depth inf bathymetric information. And you can actually create something like this here. Let me show you. So what you see here looks like a phylogenetic tree of species, right? But it's actually an island cladogram. So what you have here at the bottom, so the y-axis is time. At the bottom, you have one ancestral landmass, 
a laser pointer is not showing very well. And then as sea level rose, this started breaking apart. First this island here broke off, then this here broke into two, and then eventually into the multiple tips. And the tips today are present day islands, okay? So we have these island cladograms and we have a lot of confidence that how exactly this fragmentation process happened. Um, and we can use that to understand how extinctions happened in these settings. So one of the things that, for example, you, you can do then is you can go present day islands and say like, okay, how many species live here on each island? And if you plot that on the y-axis here against island area, you find that there's this linear relationship on this like log-log scale or semi-log scale. And that's really not particularly novel. This is really ecology 101. It's one of the fundamental patterns of ecology, the species area relationship. Bigger islands have more species, okay? So this is pretty normal. What's interesting here is if you take this graph here, this relationship, and you repeat the same exercise for mainland areas, just areas that are a few miles away are in a mainland setting. And if you do that, um, you also find that smaller areas have fewer species, but the slope of this line is quite different. Essentially what you're finding is that, especially for small islands, they have way fewer species than what areas of equal size have on the mainland. So they're essentially this missing species on small islands. And the smaller the island, the bigger the difference. Now, mind you, all of these islands down here used to be connected to the mainland. So presumably, they would have behaved the same way these open squares behave. to explain this discrepancy is the fact that islands, especially small islands, have lost species that used to be there and that have gone extinct in the meantime, okay? So essentially, what we have come to understand is that this is MacArthur and Wilson, equilibrium theory of island biogeography. If you take a, a hatchet and you cut it down in the middle and you discard the whole part about colonization. Remember, MacArthur and Wilson talked about extinction versus colonization and this dynamic equilibrium. Essentially, what we have here is a system in which we have extinction, but we don't have colonization. And there are a variety of reasons why we don't have colonization. I'll explain these in a little bit. But essentially, what you have here is a system that's dominated by extinction and that has, is potentially very useful to try to understand the process of extinction. So um, you can take, for example, let me give you a specific example. So this is the four-lined snake, okay? So that's a, a nice snake that occurs in these islands. And um, you can take present day distribution patterns of this snake. So this snake occurs today on the green islands. It does not occur on the gray islands. Now, it used to occur on the original landmass before this island cluster fragmented. So what you have here, this upside down tree is the island cladogram. And if you know that the species used to occur in the ancestral, ancestral landmass, and assuming that there hasn't been any overwater dispersal, colonization, or transport by humans, and we have a variety of evidence ranging mains to genetic patterns to, um, to cultural evidence and, we, and, and even experimental studies. You can literally like say like, well, maybe this lizard species can travel over water and you can put it in the water. And I learned very quickly not to do that, okay? <laughs> because you put them in and it's like, they just go down. They don't even swim. You know, it's just like, no, wait, <laughs> you know, try to save it. So, so they, they just don't swim basically. Um, the water is too cold and there are no rafts there. So long story short, assuming that there is no colonization, what you can do is you, recon you can reconstruct each X here is where the lineage went extinct. You can reconstruct extinctions on these paleo islands. And because we have information on the habitat, the size, the, even the climatic conditions on these islands, you can start reconstructing the past and try to figure out why things went extinct or why did they persist? 
and what kind of patterns are there. So, um, so we can do this kind of thing. Before I show you what the results are, let me very briefly give you a couple of kind of like theoretical background, sort of like what theory predicts, okay? And basically what it says is that given the species area relationship, okay, you would expect that if you have an, int an intact area and you have 100% of the species, as you start fragmenting the place and destroying it and reducing its area, you're going to start losing species in a nonlinear fashion, okay? So this is what biogeography predicts. And if you look a little bit more carefully, um, so let's do a little thought experiment here. So let's say we have originally an area that's as big, it's the dotted line here, okay? So it's A as, as big A and B. And then let's say it's a forest fragment and we go down and we just chainsaw everything down, we're left with area A. So now we go from an area that's A and B overnight down to an area of A, okay? Um, reduce the area. We would expect based on the species area relationship that the smaller area is not gonna be able to support the same number of species, but a much smaller one. And indeed, what theory predicts is that if the original number of species in the big fragment was S0, and the new proper number is, let's say, S1, okay, you can say the moment you come back the next morning after you've chainsawed half of the place down, and you go and count how many species are in fragment A, you'll probably find pretty close to the original complement. They're still on this small thing, but there are too many species. So in biogeography lingo, this is a supersaturated fragment. It has more species than what it should have. And essentially what happens then is over time, it has this extinction debt it needs to pay. And the process in which it pays extinction debt is community relaxation, which sounds very relaxing, very nice, but it's basically death. It's like the death of species. They all drop down. And the pattern is similar to radioactive decay. So it's this steep loss at the beginning and then it's, it slowly tapers out. So this is what theory tells us. Let's see what the real world shows us. So I can show you a graph here. This is from each dot here is an island. And what you have here is on the y-axis is essentially percent saturation. It's basically how many species an island harbors relative to the corresponding area on the mainland. So we established earlier that they have fewer species than on the mainland. But what you see here is this percent saturation really differs by island area and island age. So area is out here. What you see basically the larger an island is, the more saturated it is, the fewer species it has lost basically. The same way, the older an island is, the more species it has lost. That's this, this axis here, okay? So essentially what we are seeing is that area and, um, and age work in conjunction in pushing the species of, an, of a region down to promote extinction, they're associated with extinction. And for the first time, we we're able recently to reconstruct how species have gone extinct over time. So I want to show you very briefly if the technology allows me to do that. I'm gonna switch screens and um, it takes a second and show you how this process goes over time. So what we have here is um, the a simulation. This is the data we've been able to create and sort of like um, in, a, in a software called Gapminder. I want to show you how things change over time. So what you see here is the x-axis is a uh, number of species on an island. Each dot is an island, a present day island. And then this here is area of an island on a log scale. And what you see here is a pattern where you have this like cloud of data points that start low and then kind of like flatten out as they rise. And this is basically what it's, it's, it's an expression of species area relationship. Bigger islands have more species, okay? There's nothing surprising. Um, and by the way, bigger dots, bigger bubbles 
indicate just, again, bigger islands, okay? So this is the situation at present. And what I want to show you is how things have changed over the last 24,000 years. So this is the first time we've been able to, to show this. So you're the first ones to see it. Um, here are the five ancestral land masses. Remember, you start with one continuous land mass that then as sea level rises, it becomes fragmented. And they they're big and they have the full set of species, of ancestral species. And the number on the big number in the background is the number of centuries. So this is basically tells us how many, as it goes down, it shows how things started 21,000 years ago and how they're going to turn out in the present. So watch this. So we started at the beginning, sea level is rising pretty slowly and there isn't much going on, but what you'll see is eventually some of these bubbles will spawn smaller bubbles, which are islands that kind of like uh, split off. And then they all start, you start having more and more of these and they all start moving to the left. And essentially what's happening, this shift to the left is the loose species, this is extinction. So the pop up, they drop down first, and then slowly over time, they're losing species. So what you're seeing here is this process of extinction happening over the years. Um, let me show you briefly, let's, let's run it again very briefly. And <clears throat> what I want you to notice is how when an island spawns off, it tends to kind of like fall down. But then it's going, it is at the, at the right of this line that I showed you. So it's basically super saturated. And then you see extinction, community relaxation acting and starting to correct by pushing the, each dot, as you see, for example, this island there, it's losing species and it's slowly sliding to its appropriate species number, okay? And the color denotes the different island clusters. So red is the cyclades, for example, um, and you can see how the number of, of islands increases rapidly after 16,000 years, we already have the majority of islands. By 18,000 years past, we have the full number of islands, now they're just losing species, okay? All right, so let me switch back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so you're with me up to now? Yeah, okay. So hopefully by now I've uh, showed you that there's a lot of extinction going on in this system. And uh, what I want to sort of like, instead of looking at the whole community level, let's do something a little bit more interesting. Let's start looking how individual species respond to these stressors. So one of the most fascinating things that I discovered when I started doing this business is that extinction is not random process. What you find, it's a highly predictable process. And there are basically some species that disappear first at the drop of a hat. And then there are other species that will just hang on to the bitter end. There's gonna be a tiny rock left in the sea, storm tossed, and they're still hanging on there. They're surviving, okay? So I found the analogy a lot, like what you see maybe in any kind of Antarctic life documentary, which is, um, you know, you have these penguins sitting on the ice and they have to go and forage. And they're kind of like afraid to go into the water because they're sea leopards, they're, they're predators. So they form this queue and then the back guys in the back start getting hungry and start pushing the ones in the front and the ones in the front really don't want to go into the water. And finally, the first one drops in the water, okay? And everyone goes and cranes their neck. And if it disappears, if it doesn't come up again, then suddenly everyone loses their appetite, right? They're not hungry anymore. They don't want to go into water. But if it pops up, they all line up and they start dropping into the water. And exactly the same thing happens with species. There are some species that always disappear first, and then you know it's the next guy and the next species and the next species in a very predictable fashion. From a conservation perspective, this is really interesting. I mean, what determines whether you're at the very beginning of the queue or whether you're at the very end. I mean, this is important because it can help you as a conservation manager to focus your attention on these species that you know are really susceptible. So we spent a fair amount of time doing this analysis and some of the results are pretty obvious, which is 
It turns out that the main thing that matters is, can you live in a high density situation? Can you maintain a dense population on an island? Number one. Number two, are you have a generalist? Both of these are important in conjunction because they basically mean if you're a habitat generalist and you can maintain dense populations for a given island size, you're going to have a large population. And the larger your population, the better your chances of surviving. Okay. So, on some extent, this is pretty obvious. It's sort of like intuitive. But after I published that, I was like, I really felt that there was something missing in the story. And then when we went back and revisit the data a few years later, we discovered that indeed there was a big component we were missing. And that had to do with heat tolerance, with the ability to deal with hot, dry environments. Essentially what you find is that here on the y-axis, we have extinction rate, which is basically um, a number that tells you how, whether you're at the beginning or at the end of the queue. And then this here is the latitudinal midpoint of the range of a species. Basically species on this end here are northern, almost polar species that live in cold environments and they tend not to like dry, hot situations. And then here on the other end are species like chameleons that are subtropical. And what you find is that these subtropical species have much lower extinction rates than the other ones. And if you try to unpack that a little bit more and try to figure out why is that, what you find is a lot of it has to do with habitat availability. So if you have a northern species like the green lizard, it really lives only in very cold, moist, high elevation environments. And if you look at the overall Aegean landscape, there are very few of these patches where they can live. So as a result, there isn't a lot of habitat suitability for that species. And in versus something like Cochise gecko here, which is perfectly happy to basically live in a desert where it's hot and dry, okay? And what we find is that as the, um, the higher, the lower the amount of suitable habitat available that you like, the higher your extinction rate. So it seems that the mediating factor is the availability of suitable habitat that dooms this Northern heat intolerant species. So up to now, I give you the results the species perspective, okay? What makes a species more susceptible to extinction than another one? It turns out there's also a, 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 an island component to this, which is some islands really retain a lot of species over time and other ones just shed species in no time. What determines that? So here I have to <clears throat> give a shout out to Sam Kalb, who was a, a master's student who just graduated, who did this tour de force of analysis, of GIS analysis, trying to reconstruct paleo environments. So it's amazing the amount of information that's available today about how things used to be, how the climate used to be six, eight, 12,000 years ago. So you can take this information, analyze it, and try to figure out what characteristics are associated with extinction. So when you do that, what you find is that number of extinctions, first of all, we confirmed the earlier result that number of each dot here is an island. And you see that the number of extinctions is first associated with island area. Smaller islands have lost more species. And then also older islands have lost more species. No surprise there. There are some other interesting results. So for example, <clears throat> we find that the number of extinctions is associated with the roughness of an island. This is a GIS metric that tells you about how uneven the surface of the island is. When I first saw that, I was like, oh, that's a measure of spatial heterogeneity. That's a good thing. But it turns out what it really translates into is having an island that looks like this. It's very steep, very rocky, very dry, not a lot of soil, not very productive. And it turns out these islands do not retain species very well. At the end of the day, it's because they don't have a lot of resources. Um, <clears throat> there's another really important component. It has to do with climate, with local conditions. Islands that tend to be hot in summer, hot and arid, um, lose a lot of species. So that also suggests that temperature and climate actually has a role in playing in maintaining species. And then the other thing is uh, amount of desiccation. So how much uh, precipitation 
used in Ireland used to have and how much it has today and how much it has desiccated. And that in turn translates into more extinctions. So just to give you the conclusions briefly, what I hope I have showed to you is that habitat fr fragmentation results in massive extinctions um, and that these results are stronger on smaller and older islands that grew over time. And habitat fragmentation exacerbates the effects of climate change. And the reason is because in a fragmented landscape, species cannot track a change in climate. They're stuck where they are and they will their survival or they go extinct. Um, and at the, conversely, global climate change exacerbates the effects of fragmentation because it desiccates small fragments. You have these edge effects that are more severe in small areas that really undermine the survival of species. Extinction is uneven. Some species are much more susceptible than other ones. And um, um, yes, and um, northern taxa tend to go more extinct because they have less habitat available to them. Um, so the conservation lessons of this is you really want to maintain big fragments um, and you want to make sure that you um, try to maintain habitat connectivity either through corridors or by improving the, the quality of the matrix. Um, and then also you really want to focus on preserving cool, mesic, vegetated environments, things like north slopes, for example, you want to put, put your protected areas in areas that are likely to remain cool, north facing slopes, wetlands. So you um, maintain the macroclimatic conditions that are necessary for the survival of these taxa. Um, so this is kind of like the big lesson in terms of like what happens to communities overall. Now, we can try to see what happens on the individual population. And the reason why we want to do that is because um, essentially what happens is um, when we look at, um, while the, the death of the last individual of a species is a very dramatic event and kind of like denotes the end of a lineage from a conservation perspective, that is kind of un uninteresting because what really matters much more is what has happened in the process that led to the demise of the last individual. So it's important to understand the population processes that lead to this loss of species. So you want to look at this in a more holistic process rather than kind of like take the macro approach, like what happens with individual species? So I want to unpack this black box of extinction. And we did that by focusing on the Aegean wall lizard, which is a very handy model organism. Um, and we try to figure out, while, while we do that, we can compare how do these really, these populations are really small islands do relative to populations that are on big islands, for example. Um, and while you do that, you have to be really careful when you compare these populations to um, distinguish adaptive from non-adaptive processes. So what I mean with adaptive processes is the situation on a 
distance off. You don't you barely touch the lizard. And then on some of these small islands, you hold the lizard by the tail and it's not coming off, right? So that suggests that um, why having an expensive house insurance in an area where there's no flooding, no earthquakes, no fire, no tornadoes, right? So this is the same mentality. So you see these changes predicted by theory happening in the real world. Um, we also did experimental introductions, experimental evolution, where we introduced uh, lizards from big islands onto small islands. And here, um, credit goes to Colin Donahue, who, a former student in the lab, who has done a lot of these like very labor intensive work, and where we tracked how species evolve in small island environments. And <clears throat> what we saw is we focused on bite force, okay? because a little bit like the way the grants, Peter and Rosemary Grant looked at how uh, Darwin's finches can crush seeds. And we find similar things there. We see like over the course of just very few years, bite force here becomes stronger and stronger. Um, and so you have this very strong selection. Probably some of it has to do with having um, to eat harder food. You know, if you're on a small island where there's no food, any kind of hard beetle, stone hard beetle, you'll try to eat it. But then on top of that, um, you'll see um, there are a lot of aggressive interactions and having a strong bite force really makes a difference in being able to fight for mates and for food. So all of this stuff is adaptive. Let me very briefly in the last few minutes show you some of the non-adaptive stuff we're working on. So um, <clears throat> theory again predicts that small islands should lose genetic diversity and this should have bad implications for species. There isn't a lot of good evidence for that on the ground. So um, one of the things I worked on is trying to look at this pattern where if you have a fragmented landscape, um, you have small populations, here's the, the beast, the Aegean wall lizards, um, they lose small populations, lose genetic diversity, and then this in turn, undermines the immune response and the proper ability to fend off disease. So essentially losing genetic diversity, in theory at least, translates into being more susceptible to pathogens. So some of the data I'll show you very briefly is that indeed what we find is that smaller islands have less um, genetic diversity, both adaptive and non-adaptive. Um, you see that um, Older populations tend to retain less genetic diversity. And you can look at, um, uh, at the ecoimmunology, the ability to mount, for example, appropriate immune responses. And what you find is this are comparison of small with a big island. You find that a small island of Copria, the lizards there cannot mount very good antibody production responses relative to the large islands. If you do experimental infections, they're not able to control the parasites in their blood. This is lizard malaria. So there are some pretty clear inabilities in small populations to defend themselves against pathogens. And this is reflected, this is preliminary data, in both lizard malaria and in uh, ectoparasites. What you see is like small populations and old populations tend to have heavier burden of disease. So this is the last slide. This, let me summarize very quickly. Um, so basically isolation leads to loss of genetic diversity, um, both neutral and adaptive. Um, and uh, this is more severe in smaller islands and over longer periods of time. Uh, populations then have impaired abilities to mount strong immune responses and these changes seem to be translating into higher susceptibility to disease. So I think that disease is just part of a bigger picture why populations go extinct, but it's probably an important part. So this is, for example, how you can look at this process of extinction from the macro level to the micro level, try to unpack it and figure out why actually are going species extinct and what can we do to prevent that from happening? So that's that for now. Um, thank you for uh, listening and I'm happy to take questions.
So um, how does this work here with Zoom or with... Uh... Sorry, what is this? Okay. Any questions? Okay. I think I'm supposed to toss this to you. <laughs> What's the cup? <laughs> okay. Um, um, so you talked a lot about the loss of species and how fragmentation actually leads to biodiversity loss. But also, um, we may predict that a lot of these conditions that you described and, and that lead to, to species loss also favor um, population divergence and, and divergence and, and speciation. So have you thought about actually this sort of like balance or trade-off um, among the loss of species and also the origination of new species, given that the same conditions may actually favor both, you know? Um, in like longer evolutionary time scales. So I don't know if it's, if it's something you thought about, but. Yeah, that's an excellent question. So the question is, you know, the, the, pro the process of isolation um, doesn't necessarily have bad implications. It also may actually facilitate speciation and you're very much right there. As a matter of fact, you know, all of these things I descri described here are mostly on the young islands, the land bridge islands. And this, these are the islands where there aren't too many endemic species because as I mentioned, there hasn't had been enough time for them to evolve into something distinct. Um, however, the key thing there is time scale. So these changes here happen over the course of dozens, hundreds or thousands of years. Evolution really creating new lineages tends to take in these systems, at least as far as we can tell, hundreds of thousands to millions of years. So it's really the winnowed out survivors, you know, whatever few they are, are the ones that then actually will indeed evolve into something distinct. Okay, so you're absolutely right. It's just an issue of time scale. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Wait, wait. The cube. Your, one of your early maps where you had the colors, the warmer colors mm -hmm. with more endemics. Right. And you showed that there's a geographic um, gradient there. Mm -hmm. What do you know about the amount of time that those species have been, those islands have been isolated from each other? And what processes have led to that? Since it looks like there are the Cyclades were united by what looked like a shallow, sort of a shallow shelf bridge. Exactly. However, there were other islands, probably the volcanic islands that are a very deep water in between. And so I'm wondering, what do you know about the, how many thousands, hundreds of thousands or millions of years those species, have, those islands have been separated and how long has it taken for new species to evolve? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think- so There you go. Yeah, yeah. so here's the- yeah, so essentially what happens is that the, the cyclades are essentially a, a, a pseudo land mass, mm -hmm. um, a, mainland, a pseudo mainland, I should say, um, that then fragmented, and we end up actually including it in these analysis. But especially if you look at the, there's this pattern where you see more endemic species in the southern Aegean, and the reason is because these are much, on average, much older islands. So the Crete, for example, so the, the backstop of this is what we call the Messinian salinity crisis that happened 4.9 million years ago when the Mediterranean dried out, the Straits of Gibraltar closed, there was no more inflow of less sal saline water from the Atlantic Ocean, and it turned into this mega Dead Sea basin with these super deep abyssal plains with temperatures being like 80 degrees Celsius because temperature is affected by atmospheric pressure it was but that was the last time everything was connected where Crete was connected for example so that's going back five million years yeah, yeah. and when people use molecular clocks mm -hmm. that's what they use to kind of like calibrate the clocks but um there are other lines of evidence that point that the the deepest islands are about five million years and then some of the ones here in the middle are maybe between six hundred thousand mm -hmm. and three million years ago but um it's shallower water. Mm -hmm. And th there are a number of processes going on there. I talked about eustatic sea level right. change. 
But in reality, we had to consider all kinds of other things. So we used a um, geophysical modeler that modeled the uplift of the, of the crust, which has to be con considered. Um, what's happening is in this area, you have this arc here, where down in the south, where the Aegean arc, where the African continent is shoving itself under the Eurasian plate. So there's a lot of interesting stuff going on that you have to consider. But overall, these are the old the old islands, and it's no surprise that they have more endemic species. Right, right, right. Okay. 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 Any other questions? Yeah, actually one more, yeah. unless someone else has one. I was surprised by your finding that, that increased roughness led mm -hmm. to, I can't remember whether it was higher extinction rate or smaller populations or both. Mm -hmm. But, um, and I'm wondering whether, because in, in other parts of the world, where there are montane regions, mm -hmm. we often find elevated species richness for many groups in areas of high topographic complexity. Absolutely. So I'm wondering whether this is a function in particular of the fact that you have extremely rocky, arid islands, and that th that may be a particular feature of this setting. Yeah, so, so the question is, um, wouldn't you expect in places that are rough to actually have higher species richness and more topographic diversity. And that was actually exactly my, um, my, my expectation. I was like, there's something wrong there. And then I was like, okay, let's look at the islands that have a really high roughness score. What are they? And when I actually looked at them and they all look like this here, it was like, actually, it's no wonder <laughs> there aren't too many. So it looks like the question is, um, what do you predict happens with the pattern of extinctions on an island like Madagascar, where it is an old island in the past with high diversity and with extreme variations in climate conditions from north to south and east to west? Say that again. So what do you predict happens with the pattern of extinctions on an island like Madagascar? Mm -hmm. That's an old island and it's had high diversity and has extreme variations in climate from north to south and east to west. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So Madagascar is basically a mini continent. It's much, much larger. And um, while at present, it experiences massive amounts of extinction. It's really one of the extinction capitals of the world. The reason is humans, because we've taken whatever habitats are there and just destroyed them. It's, it's, it's a conservation tragedy. Um, but the island in itself is so big that there is plenty of, um, of habitat and you would not expect to see species extinction going on on these very large scales. So I would say there shouldn't be too much extinction going on. Just the island is like, I don't know, 1500 kilometers long. And we're talking here, these vulnerable populations are on the order of a few dozen square kilometers. So orders of magnitude smaller. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Excellent. Well, that's it. If you have any more questions, come and talk to me. Thank you for coming. Really appreciate that.